The original community was set up by small crop farmers. There was no industry at that time. It was just a little farm community. I'm glad to be working off Mother Earth. And the hurricane in 1900 came through. Didn't kill anybody in Pasadena, knocked some houses off their blocks, and there's some scary stories of people being blown by the wind. Galveston, unfortunately, had major casualties, like 6,200 people died that night there in Galveston. Clara Barton, who had organized the American Red Cross. She got word of it through the World News, which is in New York City. And they fed her the information, and she decided to come down here. Well, she came down to help them, of course, and then she made her tours of all over the area after the flood had subsided. And then she got to looking around, she's saying, you know, we're taking care of these people today, and we're gonna be gone tomorrow. These farmers, the crop that they were expecting, their cash crop, is not going to show up. Without a crop, Pastina would have never came back. They needed help as far as getting back on their feet. They had to have some kind of income. They were devastated. They had nothing. She imported a million strawberry plants and just passed them out to the farmers. And so she had these strawberry plants shipped down to us to begin our new life. You plant strawberries in September, October, November, and they start coming to market in January, February, March. So it was a quick, short cash crop that would fit in, didn't interfere with the other crops that they were doing. It was a quick source of money and pass it in and just embraced it like that. That right there was pretty much the rebirth of Pasadena. It put us on the map. When the strawberries came in, that gave us a whole new life, of course. It was one of our major crops uh, in the nation. The farmers, their wives, their children, everybody came out, everybody that was in the area came out to start planting these strawberries to get the quick crop. Well, it was really just about all there was. And as they became abundant, we began to start selling them in other places besides this area, in the Harris County area. And I know that we had big crops that went and bought, and it did bring the biggest price. It would go up as far as Kansas. They went up to Chicago, they went all over. They went outside the state of Texas. In the early 1900s, the Pasadena area was the strawberry capital of the Southwest. That's kind of what we're known for here uh, in our early years. Well, the strawberries that we used to ship out were very unique. We understand that their uh, stems were quite long. And the stems that are long for a strawberry is about this long. And they used to take these stems and dip it in champagne and then roll it in sugar. And for the elite, that was a very good delicacy, and so our strawberries were very popular. We used to ship them out in railroad cars, and they went all over the United States. Most of it was shipped out of, off of the railroad track here in town at the depot. Very much an industry there, and they, they had, the railroad would stop there, and they had boxes that were stamped past it that they loaded on. There was a train track that ran through there, and they used to load cases and cases of strawberries on that train and ship them out of, actually out of state. They'd go all over Texas and out of state. It was well over a hundred box cars a year of strawberries that they were sending out to the northern states. You talk to anybody in Houston of the older generation and they all used to go out and pick and yeah, a whole bunch of them. I recall when I was a, a youngster, probably uh, five or six years old, living in Pasadena and uh, going out to the strawberry patches and actually picking the strawberries. They'd give you a little can, uh, and I forgot what the cost of that can was, a nickel or whatever, and you could go out in the field yourself and, and sit there and pick the strawberries, and I used to do that. And so strawberries was the thing that just made the community sing up until the 30s. We profited pretty good all those years about that. 
until they cut the ship channel in. And of course, when the petrochemical complex came in, the strawberry farmers found out that they could make a lot more money for their families by working in the oil industry. We changed one plant, strawberries, to another plant, industrial. The strawberries sort of went back in, and went down in history. April 21st is when we became independent from Mexico. We decided that because it was so important and because Santa Ana was captured on Pasadena soil. They didn't let the schools out. They didn't even tell the kids about it. And I thought, there they are in the middle of history, one of the biggest battles of the entire world. It's a shame that more people don't celebrate you know, San Jacinto Day here around this area. Uh, we chose to continue to celebrate it because it is such a historic battle. Therefore, we felt like we needed to have an input in it, so that's how we got our, our San Jacinto Day Foundation started. In 1967, they were incorporated with the state um, as the San Jacinto Day Foundation. We had several events to celebrate our part of San Jacinto Day. Uh, one of them was a motorcade to, from us to the, to the uh, monument. Uh, we had a San Jacinto Ball where everybody wore costumes and that was a beautiful, fun thing. We didn't have any money, so we started having these San Jacinto Day Balls and uh, we raised some money. This is at one of our balls. We used to dress semi-costume and then we got into pretty ornate costumes. Dr. Epstein and his wife and I were good friends. She called me and she said, the South Houston Railroad Station is for sale for a dollar. And she says, why don't we bring it over? And I said, well, that'd be great. We could make it a strawberry station and get all the old boxes. A hurricane came along and it went into one million pieces. And I said, well, so we can't have a railroad station, but we could have a museum, and that's uh, when we started the museum. Julia and Dean Groves owned a little house on Shaver, and they wanted to make it into a business, and they wanted to get rid of the house, so they said they'd give it to us if we'd just haul it off. I got busy and talked to the city, and uh, said, could we have this space in the park? And they said, yeah and uh, that they would help us move it. And this time, we got it put down so it would, another hurricane wouldn't hit it. That was our first museum, and, and what we did was we collected from all of the, the Pasadena pioneering families, uh, some artifacts, uh, things that had to do with their family, and um, we made it as close to a museum as possible. Just a history of Pasadena in the early days from the Indians right on up through the, the days up until it became a big industrial center. This is the committee really for the very first uh, San Jacinto Day thing that was at the museum. We had worked very hard and so many people had worked very hard and everything and I thought well let's try to get some publicity. And this is where the Strawberry Festival came in. We had all sorts of ideas about uh, the banquets and the balls and the motorcades and the parades. And out of a clear blue sky, Helen Alexander said, I'd like to have a strawberry festival. And I thought, well, why don't we have a festival about strawberries, you know, uh, and our foundation and we all agreed with the idea. So it really came from Helen, who was our godmother of the Pasadena Historical Society and the San Jacinto Day Foundation. I believe it because she has a great memory and, and was very involved in the early stages, very involved and was instrumental in helping get this started. Yeah, I just thought that we were good doing a museum, going back to the roots, which was strawberries, and, and it was a farm community and that everybody knew it to come out and get strawberry. And I thought it was catchy. 
Is that, is that good enough? <laughs> that's how it started. We all agreed, and, and that's how we started, and that's how we began in 1974 to have the first Strawberry Festival. This is when we dedicated the museum and uh, had our idea of the Strawberry Festival. Opening day brought the public to us. It's the first time we'd tried anything like that. The first Strawberry Festival was over here at Pasadena High School where the marching band practices. I went over to Lonnie Keller, who was the principal of uh, Pasadena High School, and I said, can we use your football uh, field out there that you practice on to put our tent on? And he said, oh yeah. And I said, well, we're going to have this big ceremony and we're going to have a little festival and everything. And we'd like to have it fire. It's right across the street from where the museum is. And he said, well, that'd just be fine. And I think he regretted it later. And he donated the practice field in back of Pasadena High School for us to have the great big tent where we had our first strawberry festival, which was right across the street from the museum. First thing I did was call and found out that a tent was a thousand dollars to rent, and oh my goodness! I thought we had it donated because nobody would have rented a tent. I didn't think anybody rented a tent that smelled that bad. Oh, it was awful! And then I thought, well, we're going to sell little booths in it to the townspeople and everything, and we're going to have the ball, and we have a little bit of money. So I just took a deep breath and went down and rented it. <laughs> The big tent was a big tent and it, we got it from Purina and it had the odor of cow food in it, all the hay and etc. And then of course we had the rain that happened right before our very first strawberry for our week and so we had the stench of mud and Purina and etc. But we didn't care. We had company and everybody came and we were just astounded at our crowd. You know much about what tents did in those days and we kept the flaps down and it just there were so many people you would not believe how many people came to that festival and it just got like mud inside the tent. It was just horrible. We ruined their practice field. Well, it was obviously a, a small little tent, one tent function uh, with some strawberries there and uh, it was absolutely nothing like it is today. We had booths, many, many booths inside, but we told them that they all had to be pretty. They had to be showing strawberries and all of this, and they all did. The first strawberry festival was, the, the, the vendors consisted of people who wanted to do fundraisers like sell chocolate candy for the Boy Scouts and uh, uh, sell a, a quilt from uh, the DAR and they, they were our vendors. They set up their own tables and they made, they made their own way and everybody circled around that tent to, to all of the vendors. But they had to buy a booth and they were only $25 so <laughs> we didn't know if anybody would come so you couldn't charge very much. We had a, a trailer that was pulled in, a great big trailer, and that's where we had the beauty pageant, and that's where we had the choirs and the bands and that we had to entertain the crowd, and that was set over on the side. She had a little school for children, and the children sang the Texas songs for the opening. And so I brought my choir out there, and we stood on the front porch of the Strawberry House, and we sang our Texas songs. Uh, in our little old blue robes and everything. We thought we were really, really important. I don't think she intended to get 7,000 people. I think she probably only intended to get maybe 1,000 at the most, you know. I don't think that they were prepared for the number that they got, and I think they were truly surprised. Just an unbelievable number of people came. Uh, we were all ecstatic about the crowd. We, we figured we might have two or three hundred people. We didn't know it would get up to the thousands. With the uh, funds going to help support the museum, they just put the two together and they hit a home run. You have no idea of the good feeling that it has to try something that we hope is a good idea and find out it was a marvelous idea. It was a gimmick to begin with. It was just a thing to get publicity. It was, 
and it was a successful gimmick, so they decided that they would continue on. I thought, uh, we can charge more than $25 a food, is what I thought. <laughs> I don't think it was ever a, a question of, do you think we want to do this again? It was, when we do our next one next year, what we're going to do. We had just meant to have it for the one year. They decided to go ahead and make this an annual event as a fundraiser for the San Jacinto Day Foundation.